That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Black Box, the directorial debut of Emmanuel Ose Kufor, uh, which premiered October 6, 2020 on Amazon Prime, uh, which is part of a quartet of new titles that are uh, called something Welcome to the Blumhouse. Um, so October 6 with two films and then the week after will be two other new films. Um, this film was a treat. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it. It is about a man named Nolan mm -hmm. who's played by Mamadou, Mamadou Ate. Who we know from Uncorked. Mm -hmm. And Underwater. And Underwater. So he was involved in a car accident some time ago that resulted in his wife being killed mm -hmm. and him suffering a traumatic brain injury. So he has amnesia, doesn't remember anything. Mm -hmm. he, now he's left to take care of his daughter, Ava, mm -hmm. who's like six or seven. But he's struggling because he's obviously forgetful. He is having a difficult time with employment. He was a photographer, mm -hmm. but now his creative his cre yeah, juices his, don't flow the way they used that's to. That's kind of how we meet him. He's trying to sell new photographs, and uh, he's told that you just don't have the same eye anymore. <laughs> So Nolan's best friend is a Gary. man named Gary, who is a physician. Mm -hmm. And Nolan goes to visit Gary one day just to talk and explains like he's having a hard time, blah, blah, blah. Gary says, well, there is a neurologist. Lillian Brooks. Dr. Lillian Brooks, who's played by Felicia Rashad. Mm -hmm. She's interested, like she's heard about your case. She'd like to work with you. Like if you're interested, I can like give you a referral. Sure. They go up there. She is very excited to meet him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Almost unbelievably so for doctors mm -hmm. um, and their schedules. But uh, she explains to him that she has developed, uh, she's come up with sort of a treatment that can unlock, like get into someone's subconscious and unlock like lost memories. She kind of gives him like, she hypnotizes him to see if he's eligible. He is. So she says, let's do the treatment. He does the treatment and she says like you made remarkable progress mm -hmm. so i recommend that we continue but the issue is when she went into his subconscious mind which is partially aided by a machine that looks like he's wearing like a vr setup mm -hmm. called the black box while he's under he is seeing like he's experiencing memories like his wedding um meeting people but they don't have faces their faces are blurred he is also seeing visions of like a human body that is sort of contorted, like it has broken bones, it's walking like upside down, like that thing in The Exorcist. Mm -hmm. So he's alarmed. But she explains to him that the, the blurred faces are an actual medical condition caused by a brain injury, and mm -hmm. that's something we can work on. And the broken body creepy thing, that's just your mind trying to fight against like remembering, and you just have to remember it's not real. So, major spoiler, we find out that <laughs> what he's seeing is another person's memories. Sub, like memories. Mm -hmm. Who that person is, is Dr. Brooks' son. Thomas. Thomas, who died two years prior. Mm -hmm. And really, the research Dr. Brooks is doing is she can take someone's EEG, and I'm not a scientist, but she can take someone's EEG and sort of extrapolate that piece into like a person's entire mind. She can so, download it into his brain. So his kind brain. of like taking some, like a, you know, like a skin cell and then taking that DNA and creating like an entire <laughs> genome for that person. Mm -hmm. That's what she's able to do with someone's like mind. So that's what she did for her son mm -hmm. who had died two years prior. She downloaded his EEG when he was in the ER um, because she works in the same hospital provider, healthcare provider, network, whatever. And she was just waiting for the right candidate. So when good old Nolan rolled up, who had been pronounced brain dead, mm -hmm. she downloaded her son's mind into his. And mm -hmm. it took, however, she knew that she needed to get a hold of him to refine it. So he's struggling with that. We find out that her son was kind of an asshole, like used to beat his wife and didn't take care of his kid. Mm -hmm. um, they, D Gary, mm -hmm. Nolan's friend, starts to kind of put two and two together that something's not right with Dr. Brooks. He does some research. He kind of like looks into Nolan's medical record be because um, he's also part of the same network. And he notices something funny that Nolan was pronounced dead, like brain dead. And then he went to see Dr. Brooks, 
And then all of a sudden, like, he's been revived. Mm -hmm. And she's a neurologist, not like, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she, She's not resuscitating people, so what the hell did she do? I think what the medical record showed that it was just... That was suspicious that she kind of had him all to herself for this period. Well, of time. because he talks to another doctor who was on staff that night and he says, Yeah, we were so lucky. Like, Dr. Brooks came in, swooped mm -hmm. in, she took over, had him by himself, mm -hmm. and next thing we know, he comes out having been revived. So he, conf he confronts Dr. Brooks while she's performing a treatment on Nolan mm -hmm. and is trying to get him out, but she says, Don't interrupt, you might cause irreparable damage. Well, while that's happening, the audience, we're seeing what's going on in Nolan's body's mind. And what we see is the two subconscious minds fighting each other, literally. So Nolan is fighting Thomas. Mm -hmm. And Thomas has the upper hand. So at the last minute, we think Thomas is going to kill Nolan, like stab him. But instead, Thomas choose to, chooses to end his own life in his mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which allows Nolan to sort of take over. Mm -hmm. So now Nolan... Nolan has, has his right mind and his right body, the end. But during the credits, we see that after Dr. Brooks has been shamed and removed from her position, she's at home with all her belongings, like her black box and all her software and computers. She still has that little like VR ocular thing and she downloads her son's uh, readings into that machine and it comes alive. Mm -hmm. So the final scene during the credits is like his conscious mind is living in these glasses and she can communicate with him. The end. All right. Go ahead. <sighs> um, well, you know, first, I think it's just kind of a pleasure to see uh, a genre film that's centered on black characters because uh, th that's still kind of a novelty. Mm -hmm. um, and one that also is quite well executed. Uh, it, it reminds me of a lot of uh, B fifties films like the brain that wouldn't die or something like that where the technology doesn't quite exist yet But these concepts still kind of make sense. Um, I mean because this is really something we've already seen in Total Recall and the visualization of um, Nolan in his subconscious is much like the sunken place and get out so there there have been some comparisons to that but I, I felt this is very um, comparable to Brandon Cronenberg's The Possessor and these two psyches and one body trying to uh, battle for control of the host, uh, which I really liked. Um, the cast, I think, is great. Uh, Mamadou Ate, uh, who's really good and uncorked, I think also elevates this considerably with a yes. well-rounded performance. Um, and then Felicia Rashad, of course. Uh, that To me, this is the best thing outside of a Tyler Perry film uh, that we've seen her in in her kind of later career. I, I think we'll never be able to extricate our image of her as Claire Huxtable, but also that image I think is you turn on its head quite effectively here because she's so um, inviting and warm. And I think you had also compared it, their, her introduction to Nolan is almost kind of like Dr. Frankenstein almost and like. <laughs> Yeah, because <laughs> very, she's very eager to get a hold of him. But at the same time, you're like, oh, but it's Felicia Rashad. Like, it's fine. Um, she's and, supposed to help. Right. And my first note was actually like, how refreshing that she's not just somebody's mom or grandma again. And come to find, of course, she is, but she's given so much more to do. Yeah. Uh, and to me, I think this is the best thing she's been in since for Color Girls. Yeah. Um, and I'll, of course... Although her role in... What's the movie where she is, um, like... She has like a farm of like old people and she steals their social security checks. Oh, that's a fall from grace. Fall from grace. That's, yes, but that, that movie's crap, but she was entertaining She's entertaining, entertaining in it, yeah. but that's not... It's <laughs> no, not, this movie's much better. The writing, I think, it's a simple story. Like the science behind what she's doing is not obviously explained in a way that I'm, I'm sure... Oh, it's not so invasive, yeah. No, but I think it effectively takes us initially from being what seems like a legit drama mm -hmm. to... You know, like, not necessarily horror, but, like, psychological suspense thriller, maybe. My favorite scene is actually the pivot, uh, where it, it totally becomes something else, and where the twist, uh, some, the, the twist has already kind of been revealed, but another one comes when um, Mamadou is doing this excellent job of um, seeing his previous wife as Thomas, Thomas's previous wife, played by Charmaine Bingwa, Miranda, uh, and... And her response to that actress's response to him, he's welling up and tearing up, and then he starts looking around the room and sees that he's been excised completely. 
um, and we come to find that he was the one that was, of course, beating her. He was abusive. Right. Uh, so, th yeah, I, I, I like how that pivots uh, very well. Uh, it all, it kind of reminded me of, there's this Kate Chopin short story. It's a very short story. It's called The Story of an Hour, and it's about a woman who learns her husband is dead, and she goes up to her room, and everybody thinks, like, oh, she's... She's in anguish over it, but she's actually celebrating. She's like, oh, finally I'm free. And then her husband shows up at the door. Like, yeah. false news. <laughs> um, that, that's how I felt for this woman, Miranda, uh, in this role. Um, Everything worked for me. My only gripe would be, and you had explained it, the daughter, Ava, she is a little too precocious, a little too grown for my taste, but it makes sense to me that she's had to deal with you know, the loss of her mother, having to help her dad. Yeah. So she needs to sort of become a grown-up faster. I just, I think just because I don't really necessarily care for children and definitely don't like children who are grown, but well acted. I think she's forced to be, and it, yeah. does, it does ride that fine line of so precocious it's twee uh, at some parts, but then it also does pivot back to how she responds, the actress is Amanda Christine, is the young girl, how she responds to or interprets her dad's behavior towards her as being unhappy with her. And, and there are moments that felt um, very genuine in there, but yeah, it, it, if I had anything to, that really kind of detracts from this scenario, it's probably a little too much with her uh, in those moments. But you feel bad for her. Uh -huh. uh, it was written by Stephen Herman and Wade Allen Marcus, and uh, Wade Allen Marcus, of course, is a uh, supporting character on Insecure. Um, I don't know, I just was, uh, overall, I thought it was a very fun film. The only note I want to say is, I think this would make an excellent TV series, because there's so many components to the story mm -hmm. that I think would be very satisfying over, you know, four or five seasons. So maybe someone will pick that up. <laughs> For some reason, that your idea about that makes me think of this old Nick Nolte series, Rich Man, Poor Man. Um, I also liked some of the terminology. Um, uh, Miranda talks refers to Rashad's uh, hypothesis as digital voodoo. Digital voodoo. Which, I, I, you know, I, and if they had had more time, I think there's a way to... Um, kind of navigate some of those. Oh, they do shade Bobby Brown. Yes. Because Nolan asks Gary, well, did I ever like abuse my wife? And Gary's like, no, like, wh why would you think that you like all of a sudden turn into Bobby Brown? And I thought that was such a weird reference because I would think the reference would be Ike Turner, but. Or, or even Mike Tyson for but, more recent. But I don't know, I mean, maybe Bobby Brown was accused of beating up Whitney, I don't know. Not that I know, but uh, okay. What would you give this film? I would give it three and a half out of five. I would give it three and a half out of five as well. Thank you.